Minhas senhoras, meus senhores, anuncio a entrada do presídio. Podemos sentar. Quando eu te 
mais uma vez, boa tarde e muito obrigado à Tuna Acadêmica da Universidade Pedagógica. Eu penso que é uma oportunidade também de vendermos os nossos serviços, que te, não só estamos em livros, não estamos só em arquivos, não estamos nos laboratórios, mas também temos alguma especialidade que é esta de poder em alguns momentos expressarmos aquilo que somos, aquilo que sentimos através da canção. É, hoje é um dia de festa, estamos aqui no Instituto Nacional de Comunicação de Moçambique para dar continuidade às comemorações da vida e obra do saudoso presidente Samora Moisés Machel. Carinhosamente tratado por Samora Machel. Samora Machel é reconhecido e consagrado como pan-africanista, internacionalista e nacionalista que lutou pela libertação do mundo colonizado, em especial da África Austral e de Moçambique. Antes da apresentação do programa do dia, gostaria, com a permissão da sua excelência, o magnífico reitor da Universidade Pedagógica, apresentar o presídio que é constituído pela carinhosamente Mamã Graça, que é a nossa ativista social, e pelo professor Tinico Sam Malulek. Gostaria também de apresentar mais uma pessoa que constitui este presídio. that last year Wait a bit and just
opportunity to explain yourself, uh, Professor, uh, the reason why you are Malulek. If you're coming from Gaza, don't uh, feel afraid or ashamed of saying that. I, I would like to uh, salute Mama Grasa, Mother Grasa, and thank, uh, thank you for this opportunity again. Uh, again, uh, to, doctor, to Dr. Elena Fernandez, who is representing on behalf, UZ, on behalf of the, the National Institute of Communication of Mozambique, I see uh, many, many uh, known figures, friends, and, uh, and, known, uh, and uh, accountants, performers, uh, former uh, ministers that are here. Uh, family, friends, uh, from, from my shell friends, my shell family, uh, professor, colleagues, uh, of, officials from SFDC. Uh, I, I leave here a, a profound salutation. I, I want you all to feel uh, saluted. And my apologies once again for this delay that we had in this uh, commencement. We have had this uh, series of uh, lecturers, uh, master lecturers, under the team Freedom and Emancipation and the State Fundaments, in partnership with uh, different institutions and foundations. But the, the aim, the objective is always to be able to consecrate Samora Michelle as an intellectual, but also as a, a, a Pan Africanist, as a nationalist, and as an internationalist that uh, has done everything in his power so that Mozambique and Southern Africa would be, could be countries, free countries, and emancipated countries. As you can see here, as you can, I, I, I thank you for having switched off that light. I was ashamed of, of asking. As you can see, our purpose is to make this circumstance an annual event, aiming at, uh, first of all, consecrating the, the, the Samora Marshall in the Mozambican Academy, renewing the idea and the purpose of the national Mozambican identity, mainly equal, equal, e e equality among women, among men of all the world. And secondly, to contribute for the scientific uh, uh, in deepening and uh, Samora Michelle place in the nationalism, Mozambican nationalism story, Pan Africanism, and in the discolonization world process. So this, these events. They will be forward by publications and other workshops around the, the, the person of Samora Michelle that is, have left us 30, 36 years ago. But we still continue feeling that our youths, our young people, they need now more than ever. Uh, of taking grasp, uh, uh, grasping, taking hold of Samora Michelle ideals so that our country may ref refine the, define the ways to development, peace, and reconciliation. Dear guests, I would like to end by thanking the, the attendance of everybody and I thank in particular Professor Niku Maluleki that uh, will leave us, will, will, will give us a bit of what they have been his studies and researches on the tracks, on the tracks of Samora Michelle. And uh, I would like to particularly to thank uh, Mama Grazza for once we cannot, we are not always together in these moments. Oftentimes, we don't want this to be part of the group that prepares and organizes, but 
we can never leave, uh, put a uh, debate from that. That's why I would like to thank you for this effort, for this communication. And thank you, everyone, all our partners, the National Communication Institute of Mozambique, Alcance, TV Cable, uh, Proportions, um, um, Namasha Waters, the universities that are here and the foundations that who directly or indirectly supports us for us to host these these lectures, these uh, master uh, uh, lectures. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And now. I'm going to invite uh, Professor our our Tiniku, our, our professor, to be able to to present to uh, the the master class the the lecture. Professor, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, maybe I should start by clarifying the Maluleke matter and the Gaza province. Eh, <laughs> Gaza. <laughs> E Gaza Haleni, E Gaza Nkulu. Mamana Grasha Machel, President of the Samora Machel Foundation and world renowned advocate of the rights of women and young people. I am in awe of your humility and your service to our generation and very thankful for your invitation for me to speak here today. Members of the Samora Machel Foundation Board, a foundation that honors the memory of Machel by leveraging some of the most needed and the most impactful community initiatives. I went into the website and uh, between my French and my non-existent Portuguese, I could see all the wonderful work that the foundation is doing. Members of the Marshall family, in particular, my sister Josina, who is, in a, who is absent today, herself a gallant activist against gender-based violence in her own right. It is she who persuaded and pursued me to be here today. Professor George Ferrao, Rector of the Pedagogical University of Maputo, staff and students of that university, Engineer Tuaha Mote, Chairman of the Board of Directors at Mozambique Communications Regulatory Authority. Descendants of Musa Ben Biki, people of Mozambique, children of Samora Machel, comrades of Eduardo Mondlani, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. Words alone will never be able to express the depth of my joy and my gratitude at being invited to deliver the second Samora Machel lecture. I am greatly honored to be accompanied today by a small delegation from South Africa, fellow South Africans, businessman and top-notch accountant, Mr. Alex Mabunda, if you can just raise your, your hand. 
Dr. Robert Nkuna, who is Director General of the Department above all departments in the South African government system. I also have my own brother, Walter Maluleke, if he could just raise his hand. There were two other South Africans who were supposed to be here. I'm not sure if they made it. That is Joshua Maluleke and Zakani Nzangwisi. I don't, I haven't seen them. The people of South Africa owe their priceless freedom to the sacrifices of ordinary Mozambican men and women, Mozambican freedom fighters. Among the many Mozambicans who are heroes of our freedom, the hallowed figure of the son of Mandande Moises Machel and Guguye Teman Zimba, known to us simply as Samora Machel, stands tall. Throughout the years of struggle, many of our leaders from South Africa and from the broader region of Southern Africa all found in Mozambique an oasis, a sanctuary, and a place of restoration. All of the above aptly personified in the warmth, the love, and the wisdom of the person of Samora Machel. For this reason, when South, uh, South, Southern Africans come to Mozambique, whether they come from Tanzania, or Zambia, or Namibia, or Zimbabwe, or South Africa, coming to Mozambique is, in more ways than one, always a homecoming. It is always an enactment of what the Matitken poet Aimé Césaire dubbed un retour au pays natal. It is always a return to the country of our birth, or what Amilcar Cabral called a return to the source. And this in more ways than just the purely literal. That said, there is a framing battle out there, a branding battle in today's language, in terms of which there are several pictures and several portrayals of Mozambique. One framing which both puzzled and perturbed me is to be found in the opening lines of Stephen Emerson's otherwise very useful book on the Frelimo Renamo conflict of 1977 to 1992. The title of his book is The Battle of Mozambique. And this is the picture of Mozambique he paints with his first lines in that book on the first chapter, and I quote him. Mozambique is one of those flukes of history born of unbridled European imperialism and competitive Western nationalism, forged in conquest and molded by factors largely outside its own control. The country and its people have rarely been able to determine their own fate." End of quote. So that's how Emerson begins his otherwise useful books. I find this both astounding and unacceptable, a portrayal of a country comprising some of the bravest, some of the most determined, some of the most resilient people on earth, such as the Mozambicans. I refuse to believe that uh, they are children of a historical fluke, as Emerson suggests. The suggestion that 
Mozambique originates in and is created in the image of European imperialism and nationalism is inadequate. I do not know this Mozambique that is painted here. I don't know this Mozambique which was ever completely and totally subdued by imperialists and imperialism. I think this is a fictional Mozambique. I do not know these Mozambicans of whom Emerson is speaking, whose desire for freedom was ever so completely extinguished that they gave up on their determination to find freedom. Certainly, the picture of Mozambique which Emerson paints is not the Mozambique of Samora Machel. It is not the Mozambique of Eduardo Mondlane. It certainly is not the Mozambique of Josina Machel. Have generations of Mozambicans not waged an anti-colonial war in so many ways and at so many levels for more than 400 years, something which Stephen Emerson himself admits to. It must be remembered that when Vasco da Gama and his entourage, then en route to India, stopped over in Mozambique from the 2nd to the 29th of March, 1498, the locals had to hound him out and chase him out as they feared that he might wish to overstay his welcome. Vasco da Gama did not leave Mozambique peacefully. He had to be chased out after being here for almost a month on his way to India. How can people whose artistic industry gave us the musical chance of cultural resistance of such people as uh, Fanny Mfumo, Mureira Chungweika, Wazimbo, Orchestra Marabenta, traditions which have since been taken up by young Mozambican rappers and artists of all kinds. I know that Stephen Emerson had no malice and that he meant well. However, the Freudian slip with which he commences his book is indicative of one of the important tasks that Samora Machel has left for us. The task of creating the world in our own image and not to let the world create our people and our countries in its own image. Yes, as Africans, we were colonized, but we never allowed colonization into every corner of our soul and every corner of our spirit. Yes, we were brutalized at the turn of the 20th century by King Leopold of Belgium in the Congo and the German Kaiser who in Namibia committed perhaps one of the first genocides of the past century where unspeakable atrocities were committed. But no, we never handed our souls and our spirits to the colonizers and imperialists even in the face of their terror and they agreed, as Adam Hochschild correctly characterizes their behavior in his book titled King Leopard's Ghost. This then is one of the greatest lessons of and from the men whose life we commemorate in this lecture, Samora Machel. He taught us to proudly guard our identity and our image the distinguished man of letters from Nigeria, Wole Shoinka, in his book titled Of Africa, has demonstrated that no matter how much they have tried to burgle and to distort 
the history and the image of Africa, calling it the dark continent again and again. We have proven to them that Africa is no dark continent. Rather, it is the beholders who suffer from severe cataract. I'm quoting Wole Shoinka's exact words. No matter how much writers, missionaries, colonialists of the West have tried to paint us as everything they wish not to be, history has borne witness to our enduring dignity, our unquestionable humaneness, and our irreducible humanity. In his book titled Butterflies and Barbarians, the late South African historian and my good friend Patrick Harris demonstrated convincingly how some Swiss missionaries working in South Africa and Mozambique out of great ignorance reduced local people to barbarians whom they ranked at the same level as butterflies, if not lower. As a case study, Harris focuses on the work of amateur entomologist, amateur anthropologist, and trained missionary Henri Alexander Junot. But before the ink could dry up in Juno's two-volume framing of black South Africans and black Mozambican people as people of the past and as God's stepchildren, Pixli Kaseme, Charlotte Makleke, and others were forming the African National Congress in Bloemfontein right at the time when Juno was publishing his books. Within half a century thereafter, that is in 1962, several Mozambican anti-colonial formations and student organizations met in Dar es Salaam, consolidated and reformed themselves into one of the most powerful liberation fronts, Frelimo, under the leadership of Eduardo Mondlan himself an initial protégé of Swiss missionaries. Now, having touched on the year 1962, let us move right along to 1963 and move back into the path of the theme of our lecture. The story is told that sometimes in April 1963, South African veteran, struggle veterans, Joe Slovo and J.B. Marx, were forced into exile. Their final destination was that city which was like a magnet for all freedom fighters in those years, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Indeed, Nyerere and Dar es Salaam were to Mondani and Marshall what Marshall and Maputo were to Oliver Tambo, Albi Sex, Ruth First, and countless other South African leaders. But I digress. I was telling the story of how Slovo and Marx, together with 26 other South Africans, were scheduled to fly from Francistown in Botswana to Dar es Salaam on a small aircraft one day in April 1963. But just before their small plane left Francistown, something historic happened. And this is how Slovo remembered it, and I quote, a short while before our departing, a thin, energetic man asked if it was possible to get a seat on our plane as he wanted to join Frelimo forces. JB, immediately took the decision that one of our cadres should be taken off the plane to make room for the Frelimo recruit. The recruit who traveled with us, and he remembers it very well and tells the story today, is Comrade President Samora Machel. At that time, we were not aware what valuable cargo we were carrying, end of quote.
This is a story which Joe Slovo told often, including in his eulogy for Michelle on the day of his funeral. The ties that bind the people of Mozambique and the people of South Africa go deep and they cut both ways. Indeed, the historic ties that bind the peoples of Southern Africa run in the veins and in the arteries, both figuratively and literally. That's why you find Malulekes in the Gaza province and in South Africa and in Swaziland. If Slovo and his comrades did not realize how precious the cargo they were carrying in that small Dakota aircraft was, when the founding Frelimo leader, Eduardo Mondlane, interviewed Michel, the young Michel in Dar es Salaam in April 1963, there was no doubt in Mondlane's mind that Michel belonged to a special breed of young Mozambicans at that time, fully committed to the liberation of his country. Years later, in his preface to Allen and Barbara Isaacman's book on Samora Machel, retired South African Judge Albi Sex, who lived in Mozambique and nearly died in Mozambique. He certainly lost a limb in Mozambique because the apartheid uh, government sent him uh, a very bad present, a bomb. So this is what he says in his preface to Allen and Barbara Isaacman's book on Samora Machel, and I quote Albi Sachs. Samora was a proud African, a proud liberator, a proud internationalist, and a proud and humane human being with great cultural sensibility. He had his faults, and the system in which he grew and he helped to grow had its deficiencies, but flaws and all, Opovo, the people, are right to revere his memory. My generation honors and loves him for the way he transformed the nature of what an African revolutionary leader could be. He indigenized revolutionary theory. He fought against racism and tribalism and spoke passionately about the emancipation of women. He is loved by ordinary people in Mozambique today for epitomizing qualities they fail to see in most current leaders. His integrity, his warmth, his engaging and culturally rich humanity, his independence of mind and spirit, and above all, his profound and resolute determination to enable the poor to transform their lives. These are the qualities which endear him to the people. But alas, the life of Samora Machel, as we all know, was cut short. He would have turned into the grand old age of 89 this year. Leaders of Southern African states would be coming on pilgrimage to consult with him and to drink from the fountain of his wisdom. Wisdom forged in the battlefield and finessed in the stadia and town halls of his country. Wisdom accomplished in many a treacherous negotiation table. Ladies and gentlemen, 36 years and two days ago, President Samora Machel and up to 33 of his compatriots perished, as we know, when the plane in which they were traveling from Zambia crashed into the Libombo Mountains near Mbuzini outside Komarti Port, South Africa less than 200 kilometers from Maputo, actually. The curious circumstances of the crash and the even curiouser actions and non-actions of the South African government in the ensuing aftermath of the tragedy have been analyzed and reflected upon in dozens of articles, books, and book chapters. Add to these several terabytes of sworn affidavits and recordings 
in testimonies before commissions of inquiry by witnesses from all walks of life. The apartheid government appointed Cecil Margo Commission, and I quote the TRC report, concluded that the crash has been caused by pilot error, end of quote. And yet a Soviet team of expo experts, and I quote again, concluded that a decoy beacon had caused the plane to stray off course before it crashed into the mountains. Too many questions have been left unanswered. 36 years later, these questions are well known and we need not rehash them in full here. But at least three of them, which also exercised the mind of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, are worth repeating. One was a false VOR bacon hoisted on the hill in Buzini, and if, if so, by who? Second, when the Tupolev TU-134A-3 took an unscheduled 37 degrees right turn over the no-fly zone towards the hills in Buzini, why did the South African aviation authorities not warn the crew that their aircraft was not only off course, but it was actually in violation of international aviation rules? After all, the no-fly military zone was under 24-hour surveillance. Why did the aviation authorities not call to say, hey, you are breaking the law, you are flying where you are not supposed to fly, and you are flying dangerously? Thirdly, why did it take the South African authorities nine hours after the accident to inform their Mozambican counterparts of this accident? at the scene of which South African government officials arrived within an hour, if not within minutes. An accident in which the head of a neighboring state had died took them nine hours. Why? Before they contacted the Mozambican authorities. Even after the relevant minister in Mozambique had actually inquired with them if they knew anything about the whereabouts of this presidential plane. But alas, even the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whose inquiry into this matter appears to have been a last minute undertaking, done in an untidy hurry, provided neither relief nor a clear finding. Instead, the TRC recommended that, and I quote, the matter requires further investigation by an appropriate structure. So, it seems to me that until brave members of the erstwhile apartheid regime and or their collaborators from whichever side they may have come, until these people step forward and tell the truth about what really happened before, during, and immediately after that plane crash. The precise details will remain elusive. However, as I said on national television in South Africa earlier this week, just because we do not have the details does not prevent us from realizing that the Mbuzini plane accident was neither plain, as in P-L-A-I-N, no ordinary. It had assassination and sabotage written all over it. Although 34 persons died in the crash, one more person succumbing to injuries later, so that the total number of fatalities reached 35, the life of one particular 53-year-old man was particularly targeted. That man was none other than the head of that delegation, President Samora Machel. This is a man 
who spent nearly half of his life involved in one war or the other, 22 years in total, wars of liberation for his native land and wars of liberation for its neighbors before, during, and after independence. To say the above about Mandela is by no means intended to underestimate the lives and the beautiful souls of the other Mozambican patriots, highly placed members of the presidential delegation who perished on national duty with the president. Nor do I wish to undervalue the lives of the seven or so international guests who also perished in Buzini, people who loved Mozambique dearly, people who admired President Samora Machel just as much. Alongside President Machel himself, these fallen compatriots provided key and strategic services to the presidency and to the people of Mozambique. As such, they deserve the highest national and regional honors available. They, together with President Samora Machel, join a select group of African leaders who, alongside millions of ordinary Africans, paid the ultimate price in the cost of our struggles for liberation. Machel shares this unholy distinction of being assass assassinated with the likes of Patrice Lumumba, Amilcar Cabral, Thomas Sankara, and his own comrade, compatriot, mentor, and friend, Eduardo Mondlan, to mention but a few. The methodologies of assassination have differed in detail, but the tool of assassination has been frequently deployed against African leaders throughout what Nelson Mandela has dubbed our long walk to freedom. But the intention of assassination has always been the same, to take out leaders who are symbols of our unity, leaders who are symbols of our strength, leaders who are symbols of our determination to be free, to try and render us leaderless and to try and spread fear and trembling in our ranks. That has always been the aim of this litany of assassinations. In a way, apartheid South Africa's death penalty, all the questionable acts and repressive laws that propped it up was no more than a legalized form of assassination if one considers how frequently and how selectively and how devastatingly this tool was used predominantly, almost totally, against black people in general and black political leaders in particular. Many times the apartheid regime would carry out targeted or mass assassination expeditions into such neighboring states as Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. Consider the Matola massacre or the Matola raids of January 1981 and the repeated violent incursions into Habarone in Botswana all through the early and mid 1980s. Many times the regime would carry out mostly blatant, sometimes targeted as well as generalized mass assassination inside South Africa itself. The Sharpeville massacre of 1960, the massacre of children in Soweto, 1976. And consider, for example, the manner in which Fabian and Florence Ribeiro were assassinated in Mamilodi, South Africa. Consider in which the, the, the way in which Griffiths and Victoria Mkange were murdered by apartheid um, hired murderers. Consider the manner in which the young Solomon Mahlangu was hanged. Consider the manner in which Steve Biko died and was killed rather. Consider the manner in which Chris Honey 
was assassinated. But the apartheid regime had an appetite for blood that could not be satisfied internally. Their blood lust had to be outsourced and exported into the neighboring states, as we have already observed. By the time of the Mbuzini plane crash, the apartheid regime had turned the entire region into a low intensity killing field. We have to understand the Mbuzini plane crash within the context in which the regional stability was under, under threat. Samora was seen as the last hope for regional stability. It is therefore plausible and possible that in the many clandestine meetings between Pretoria and Kinshasa, between Pretoria and Blantyre in the mid 80s, Samora was identified as a great stumbling block on the way to a complete destabilization of the region. In many such meetings, the toppling of Frelimo government in Mozambique and the removal of the MPLA uh, government in Angola were no longer spoken about in harsh tones. They were no longer a secret. Now, I have taken careful note of the analysis of scholars who attempted to put, who sometimes attempted to put the blame for the economic and political difficulties that were suffocating Mozambique in the 1980s solely on Michel and Frelimo. I'm thinking here of the mildly critical essays of Dwayne Wong Omowale titled Essays on Amica Cabral and Samora Machel. I'm also thinking of Dan O'Meara's book titled The Collapse of Mozambique Socialism, in which he charges, among other things, that the Mozambique of the 1980s was a walking contradiction in terms of which the state was centralizing power and constraining democratic processes in politics and in the economy so that what happened had to happen, he suggests. Omera also charges that in the 1980s, Frelimo was, and I quote, extremely centralized and commandist and moving slowly towards a growing personality cult around Samora Michel, end of quote. Charging that, and I quote, much of the history of the early years of the independence struggle has been distorted, bled, and buried by the dictates of political conveniences. John Markham, in his book titled Conceiving Mozambique, described the aim of his book as being, and I quote, to recover, reconstruct, and reveal a more accurate account of what happened. But Markham's views were no less emotional than those of the other authors I have referred to. For example, he opines that by the early 1980s, the Frelimo government, and I quote him, beat, beat off more than it could chew, as evidenced by the disconnect, he suggests, between their over-the-top interventions and the minimal results thereof. My own view is that we commit a serious error of judgment when we read the trials and tribulations of Mozambique in the late 1970s and throughout the 1980s, including the killing of Samora Machel and his 33 compatriots outside the belligerent machinations of the South African regime at that time. This is the context within which the Nkomati Accord must be understood. For while the Nkomati Accord, from the point of view of the South African regime, may have been intended to flush the ANC out of Mozambique, it was also intended to seduce Michel into a false sense of security and thereby to reduce his influence while the regime of South Africa prepared to smash and grab. And yet, at that very time, the destabilization project was being intensified, and the volume 
of the armed banditry of which Samora spoke so often was being ratcheted up. This, as the Mobutu Seseko regime was becoming more blatant and more vulgar in its support for Savimbi's UNITA. This, as the ideologically malleable Malawian regime of Hastings Banda was flirting with the apartheid regime and fantasizing about replacing Mozambique in the bosom of colonial Portugal. As a result, Banda was becoming more daring and more brazen in his incubation of Renamo platoons. All of this happening under the spiritual, military, and financial sponsorship of the brutal and well-resourced apartheid regime of P.W. Botha. No wonder then that in the year and months just before the Mbuzini crash, there had been several summits and heated meetings between Southern African leaders, the so-called frontline states, in order to address the problem of cross-border armed banditry, which was threatening not merely to destabilize individual states, but the entire region, thus reversing the gains of independence and making a mockery of the hard-won freedom. Marshall understood firsthand that Malawi's support for Enamo at that time could pull Mozambique apart and that Zaire's support for UNITA was grossly undermining the Angolan state. It was these concerns that took Marshall to Mbala in Zambia on that fateful 19th of October, 1986. Must be remembered that Marshall did not go to Zambia to solve a Mozambican problem at that time. The issue was Angola and the role of Zaire in particular in that conflict. That fateful trip of the 19th of October 1986 became a trip which Mandela, I mean, which Marshall could not complete. A month earlier, Marshall had, and I quote from the TRC uh, report, Marshall confronted President Banda of Malawi in the presence of his Zambian and Zimbabwean counterparts in an acrimonious exchange in Blantyre. President Banda was given an ultimatum to stop his activities or Mozambique would close its borders with Malawi. After the meeting, President Marshall called a news conference at Maputo Airport saying that he would place missiles along the border with Malawi and would not hesitate to launch a preemptive strike if necessary, end of quote. Now, here's the thing. Marshall's detractors recognized how formidable a foe he was. Part of what made him formidable is that, as hinted in an earlier quote by Albi Sachs, Marshall combined several qualities in him. He was a political theoretician of the highest caliber, and more than any leader alive at that time. Marshall had the amazing ability to translate political theory into everyday language. The ability to tame the Portuguese language and forge it into a powerful language of mass communication. Several scholars have looked at Mandela's usage, I mean, Marshall's usage of the Portuguese language. He was a military general with a proven track record. Not only did he understand the Mozambican terrain from Rovuma to Maputo, he had a firm grasp of the military balance of forces in the entire region. And this at a level which few of his peers could fathom at that time. Above all, as Albi Sachs once noted, Samora had an often repeated mantra, the people never die. Leaders come and leaders go, but the people never die. He had a deep, <laughs> he had a deep natural and instinctive faith in the people. And this made him a true Democrat. 
The people felt his authenticity and they reciprocated and reflected his love back to him. Now, to accuse Michelle of building a personality cult, as one of the authors I quoted above does, or to accuse him of being a violent warmonger, as some have tried, is to misunderstand him and his times fundamentally. Such people who accuse him of these might as well accuse Mandela of creating a personality cult around himself by, amongst other things, going to jail for 27 years. In this regard, Mama Gracia Marshall was correct when in a letter of gratitude to Winnie Mandela, who had reached out to console her when Samora was killed, she said the following in the letter, and I quote her, I was still only a child, Winnie, when you first raised your fist against apartheid. Since then, you have never wavered. I wish I had your strength and courage. In this painful hour, I look for inspiration in your example. Those who have locked up your husband are the same who killed mine. They think that by cutting down the tallest trees, they can destroy the forest. But history will never forget the names of Samora Michelle and Nelson Mandela, end of quote. For reasons similar to those advanced by Mama Grasha Michelle, Thomas Sankara, in his eulogy to Michelle in October 1986, cautioned the masses against weeping. He said, let us not weep, if only because there was at that time rivers and rivers of crocodile tears, people who claimed to love Samora, and everybody knows that they didn't. Peg Bota, the South African foreign minister, was heard saying at Mbuzini, Samora was my friend. Pull the other one. To demonstrate sorrow for Michelle, Sankara argued that the people should do two things. Remember Michelle appropriately and intensify the struggle he died waging. Little did Sankara know that when he titled this Marshall eulogy a death which must enlighten us, he might as well have been talking about his own death. Almost exactly one year later, on the 15th of October, 1987, Sankara was assassinated. Just under a year after Samora was assassinated. As I move towards my conclusion, let me reiterate a sentiment expressed briefly by Albi Sachs in his preface to the Isaacman's book, when he said, Samora had his faults, and the system in which he grew, and that he helped to grow, had its deficiencies. But here is the seminal idea intended, but not fully spelled out, by Albisex. To say Michelle had faults is to say something that is true of any and all leaders, and any and all of us. To say that is to say the most basic fact about human beings. But when people say that with a tone that seems to suggest that Michelle ought to have been more perfect than all his peers and all his detractors. To, to do it in that tone is to be grossly unfair. Samora was not a perfect person. He was just a magnificent leader. Samora was not a perfect human being. He was only a leader committed to the cause of the people of Africa. We should ask no more and no less of him. Now that he is gone, even more so when he was still alive. I hinted earlier that whereas his enemies understood how formidable Samora was, his friends and those who, to quote Mama Grasha again, worshipped him, 
and perhaps he himself did not always understand or fully comprehend the potency of his influence and the magnetism of his personality for all intents and purposes. For the decade 1976 to 1986, Samora was the de facto president of Southern Africa. Never mind P.W. Botta, never mind Ian Smith, never mind Salazar and Caetano, never mind General Ariaga. Samora was the single most influential leader of Southern Africa in the decade leading up to his death. His and Frelimo's victory in June 1975, well, a year earlier actually, reverberated across the subcontinent. His and Frelimo's victory changed the game and altered the geopolitics of the region in fundamental and far-reaching ways. Zimbabweans, Namibians, and South Africans owe a debt of freedom to Frelimo and to Michel in ways that are inestimable. That is how the 1976 generation of Soweto youth was energized and mobilized. They probably would never have been Soweto 76 had Mozambique not become independent in 1975. Suddenly, South African youths at that time, I'm talking here of your Steve Bikos, your Mapetla Mohapis, your Seth Coopers, your Pandelani Nofolowodres, your Musiwa Likotas, your Obrimo Kwapes, your Strini Mudlis, your Abram Onkoputsa Tiros, your Muntum Yezas, your Itu Meleng Musalas, suddenly they realized that freedom was attainable in their lifetime, all because of, of Samora and Frelimo. The 1986 murder of Michel and his compatriots must be understood against this backdrop. Let me conclude. If Franz Fanon, using the Algerian War of Liberation as his archive, decoded to us the price of freedom, the place of Africa in the world, and our historic mission in the world as Africans. I would like to suggest that we now face a somewhat new reality, sometimes spoken of in terms of the decolonial project, while at other times it is referred to as the problem of African independent states that are ineffectual. The problem which uh, Ashil Mbembe describes as the problem of living among zombified African communities. Leaders and followers zombifying one another. Say in codependent sick relationships. The problem of the problem. colonies that are unable to deliver on the promises. A África pós-colonial está cheia de violência, violência estrutural e violência real, do norte ao sul e do, de cima para baixo. Enquanto os desafios que nós enfrentamos hoje, ao considerar o legado de Machel é daquilo de estados fracassos, fracos, no, ao nível mais profundo, nós estamos a ser de, 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 a pergunta de, 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 de habilidade ou de, 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 de não habilidade de conhecer o nosso lugar história e no mundo. Our greatest deficit as African countries today does not only lie in our many and very visible infrastructure problems, manifesting in load shedding and chronic civil strife, load shedding in South Africa and Africa. But our greatest challenge is how our minds are not yet free. Não é uma clara contradição ao conselho de Bob Marley quando ele disse em 1980, no seu, na sua canção de 1980, quando ele disse emancipem-se.
do, ah, da, 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 da escravatura mental Sim. agora e de vocês. É, mas libertem as mentes. The freedom to think, a liberdade de pensamento, be, a liberdade de ser, a, a liberdade de ser e prosperar foi precisamente a luta de Machelo e seus compatriotas. Sem esta liberdade, nenhum montante, nenhum montante de, de, de investimento direto estrangeiro ou um, processos que poderiam nos ajudar, porque as nossas mentes, as nossas mentes não estarão livres, a não ser que nós estamos livres mentalmente the disrespect of some african governments that neglect the education and skills allowing infrastructure to deteriorate and go unmaintained for years the self hate that causes africans to demonize one another on the basis of tribe rage country and origin the self loathing that has turned African men upon their sisters, mothers and girl children, the balkanization and the warlordism that is tearing Africa apart are precisely the things we must fix if we are to honor the memory of Samora Machel properly. On one of the plagues on the wall at the Mbuzini monument in memory of Machel and his compatriots who died with him. One will find the moving words of Mama Grasha and I quote those words. My children, my friends and I think that it is time to serenely bestow Samora to those who did not know him. To those who remember a little of him. To those who vividly remember him whether because they worshipped him or because they hated him. It is time to bring him closer. We should look at him directly. We should recognize his virtues, his defects, and his real humanity. It is with pride that I wish to see his legacy perpetuated by future generations." End of quote. I wish to say to you, Mamana Grasha, without any fear of contradiction, that Samora is us and we are Samora. Samora is our children and they are children. <laughs> Samora is in our hearts and in our actions. Samora will never die. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Malulek. Muito obrigado, Professor Malulek, pela magnífica aula que enaltece a vida e a obra de Samora. A compreensão da vida de, e obra de Samora Machel passa pelo conhecimento e investigação da história da África Austral. A sua aula galvaniza e encoraja os acadêmicos e a sociedade em geral em continuar a repensar e a investigar sobre o papel de Samora Machel na história de Moçambique, na história da África Austral, bem como na história mundial. Muito obrigado pelo reconhecimento deste líder na luta de libertação de África e Moçambique. Mais uma salva de palmas para o professor. Depois desta aula esplêndida, iria convidar a senhora Tânia Tomé, que vai nos agraciar com um momento cultural.
Boa tarde a todos. Boa tarde. Boa tarde, Papá Samora Marcel. Boa tarde, Mamá Graça Marcel. Boa tarde, meus amigos.